Hello, I'm Rachel Richards, former BBC correspondent, parenting coach, mother of two teenagers and two older stepdaughters. I'm Susie Asley, mindfulness teacher, mother of three teenagers, two of them are twins. Coming up later in the programme, we'll be talking about talking. What's your style as a parent? Are you a hot and cold tap, an ice king or queen? We'll help you identify your type and give you tips on how to move towards being a true parent. But first, Susie, we've had some really lovely feedback, haven't we? Yeah, really lovely. Really, really lovely. So this is on the Apple podcast and this lovely person said, these ladies make me feel like I'm at a supportive book club where tips and suggestions are thrown out for me to select what I need to get through the day, week, month. Without a support network around me, this is invaluable listening and very reassuring that we can get through the teenage years in one piece. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what a lovely thing to write. And spot on because yeah. I'd never really thought about it, but that's actually what we're sort of aiming for. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can't we can't make decisions for you, but we can kind of chat about the things yeah, and um, share our experiences. Yeah. So thank you. And Lizzie says, I find the podcast really insightful and entertaining too. You and Susie are brilliant together. She's promised to spread the word to other parents. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Oh, thank you, Lizzie. Yeah. Now, last time we talked about anxiety, which can either help us to perform better or cause huge problems. I'm feeling a bit anxious for this episode because I have a plumber working on the shower directly opposite the bedroom where we normally record it. It's so noisy that I've carried all of our equipment downstairs to the room where we watch TV. Uh, in theory, it's going to work well. The only problem is that my two crazy dogs associate this room with sofa time and tummy tickles. So if you hear any heavy panting during the recording, it's not me or Susie. So back to anxiety. We thought we'd stick with symptoms of distress and look at self-harm. So uh, Susie, there lots of the schools nowadays that are doing talks about all of these topics aren't yeah. they and you went to one last night yeah which I went to one actually really last night yeah great very very timely I bet the school didn't know about it no they didn't <laughs> it was brilliant it was this amazing lady I'm just um her name is Satvia Nijar I don't know if I'm pronouncing that mm. right she, she's um she's got an Indian name amazing amazing talk she goes around loads of schools um talking about self-harm and has se- experienced it herself it was really insightful what's happening with schools nowadays is they're being much more proactive yes. about making sure that parents know about some of the issues that can affect children at that age and trying to inform them yes. but not all schools are doing that and not all parents turn up to these no talks. I mean she went in I think the main her main mission was to talk to the children so she talked to the children in the afternoon and she's been I think it's the fourth year that she's been in going in to do this and then parents are invited in the evening if they want to come and and there wasn't a great turnout to be honest which is a real shame mm, um, mm. and it's something that it does affect quite a lot of children. I have spoken to mothers who've said that their children have been in contact with others who have self-harmed and that they're not quite sure what to say to their own children. And I've also had experience of other parents who have had to deal with it at home. And it's a really, really distressing topic. Yeah, really distressing. And I think for a parent who discovers that their child is going through this sort of distress, it can be extremely triggering, very upsetting. Mm. Now, what is self-harm? Self-harm is harming yourself on purpose, such as by scratching, cutting, overdosing on medication, biting, burning. I mean, there are really a lot of different ways of doing it. Mm. And quite often, it, people who self-harm don't only just use one technique. No. The key message is that it's not a mental illness. It's linked to mental distress. It's a symptom of underlying emotional and psychological distress. So it's really important that we don't say that this is a mental illness this yeah, person has. Really important. It's a, it's a symptom of something that's it's underlying. And usually what's underlying it is being overwhelmed by feelings, you know, sadness, guilt, hopelessness. And it can be triggered by many 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 different things yeah, as you found out absolutely. in the talk last yeah, night absolutely it's a massive list right yeah well she made she put up a whole list of things it could be caused by and then it, it was sort of slightly ironically meant you know anything <laughs> pretty much anything yes and there are certain things so for example lgbtqi um i saw a really fantastic piece where the the person who was posting it said look your child isn't doing it because they're lgbtqi what they're doing is they're trying to release emotions yeah. that aren't being helped yeah and with the list that she put up you know everyone experiences 
at least a few of the things on the list. They were like normal, normal everyday problems and bigger things too. But they don't go on to self harm. So you know, it's an awareness. There isn't one or a list of things that make you self harm. It's, it's it's complicated. Yes. So from the research I did, the people most likely to do it is more common in women and girls. What we do know is that men and boys are less likely to go to help yes. help t- with anything. That was something that was mentioned yesterday as well. It's that all the statistics that are brought out. You know, some of them are really really helpful. But they are based on people who present in hospital with symptoms. And there are an awful lot of people who are not doing that. Yes. People who are depressed, anxious, have a borderline to personality disorder or eating disorder. These are people who've experienced abuse or those who've been bereaved. I mean, there are some big things that could trigger it. But again, it's it's all sorts of reasons. And I read a really interesting blog by someone who has personally been affected And her point was that most people who engage in this find it hard to verbalise their feelings. Mm. And what they're doing is they're acting them out somehow. From reading that, I thought, gosh, that's actually really interesting because one thing we can do to help is to be able to yes. help our teenagers to express themselves. Yes. And this is obviously for anybody, even people who are not suffering from self-harm. It's it's about identifying emotions yes. and being able to put a name to it. Yeah, because it's a coping mechanism, like as in anything that is is destructive or, or numbing or, you know, all the different things that we've we've talked about some of them before. It's a coping mechanism. So, so the next question probably is what exactly is happening when they harm themselves. One of the lists I saw was there's redirection when the emotional pain is too difficult. It actually distracts them. A physical manifestation of their pain, which makes it seem easier to feel in control of it. Uh, Punishment. So they may be feeling shame and feeling that they deserve to be punished. So they're punishing themselves or release. So so people can get an endorphin rush when they self-harm and that temporary release, that, that rush then will it can be habit forming. Yeah. And um, an- another thing is uh, it can prevent people from hurting other people. So you have this awful feeling inside of what, whatever that looks like. And that can sometimes lead to hurting other people. And then as a prevention of hurting somebody else, they turn the pain on themselves. So interesting. I was listening to Desert Island Disc, which is a fantastic British program on radio. And there was the former judge and crossbench peer, Baroness Hallett of Rye, being interviewed on this program. And I distinctly remember Lauren Laverne asking her, when you have to sit through case after case of really, really terrible, terrible child abuse, and you have to listen to all the evidence, how do you cope? Do you feel emotional about it? She said, yes, I'm human. And and it can be very distressing mm-hmm. at times. And she said, well, have you ever felt like crying? And she said, yes. And she said, well, how do you deal with that? If you were the judge and you got to sit there, mm-hmm. she said, oh, it's very simple. I was told this technique, which is when I'm feeling that deep emotion, when I feel like I'm about to cry, I dig my fingernails into the palm of my hand and that temporary discomfort distracts me. Yeah, wow. And I thought, gosh, that's it. That's exactly yeah. what we're talking about. So, and that nobody would say, oh, she's self-harming. Mm. So, you know, there are levels, yes, there are levels of absolutely. this and some self-harm will present as something really drastic where they've cut themselves deeply and it's very upsetting and then there are other ways that we so it's a technique for dealing with difficult emotions yeah and we, we need to also be careful that just because somebody's maybe scratching themselves or pulling their hair and it seems more superficial than you know cutting a, a, a with a deep cut the feelings might be just as yes. probably exactly the same or not the same Their feelings are always different but but that doesn't mean that the, the feelings distress. are less you know it's not more you know the more superficial the um, the harming thing doesn't mean that the feelings are any different. That's such and a that's great really point, important. Susie. That's such a and this high kind of you, just by trying to look at how bad the self harm yeah, is no. uh, is not the right or way how of many times it. have you done it or oh that doesn't matter. You just you know just pulling a few hairs out or whatever. And it might be it might be okay, but it, you know don't presume that it's okay. So what are they most likely to do? What are we looking out for? There's scratching or pinching, impact with objects, cutting. Cutting's the one people talk about mm. a lot. Impact with themselves. So that could be where they punch themselves or yeah. uh, ripped skin, carving words into mm. themselves or Gosh. symbols, 
interfering with healing. So you may have something that, I mean, I, we've all scr- taken scabs off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've all done that. But, but this is, a, you know, more, yes. a, a bigger thing. Yeah. Burning, rubbing objects into the skin, hair pulling. And one thing to notice that 70% of those who repeatedly self-harmed use multiple ways right. to self-harm. So it wasn't just one thing yep. that they were doing. Mm. And things you can look out for, wearing long sleeves on a hot day, cuts, burns or scratches that are close together because they try to do it in a place where it's not it's easy to reach mm. but it's not necessarily noticeable. Yeah. Blood stains, finding self-injury tools. Mm. Now, I had an experience, one of my children who was in a school where self-harming started happening and it was a really interesting and worrying experience. And the reason it was interesting was because the Girls were hiding implements mm. in their under their pillows in various parts of the rooms. And so the school had some real problems with trying to track down. They had to search rooms and things to try and control it. Mm. The question is whether a parent should be doing that at home. Yeah, I mean, that would minimise the risk of, of the actual, you know, damage caused. But it's not solving the issue underneath. Um, exactly. And that's the problem. And it can feel quite intrusive to the person. Yeah. I mean, if somebody is self-harming, then, you know, my instinct would be to, you know, hide anything they could damage mm. themselves mm. with. But that's not curing it. That's not taking the problem away. That's mm. just minimising the risk in that immediate moment, I think. And what also was interesting was that there were one or two girls who were really struggling and... The reports I got was that there were other girls who then looked at what was going on and the attention they were getting and said, oh, you know, we could, you know. So there's always this question that some parents have, which is, is this attention seeking? Are they just, are they jumping on the bandwagon? And the reason I mention this is because I think we need to take any of it very seriously. And not accuse them of... And actually, what's so wrong with wanting attention? We all want attention. So <laughs> actually saying, oh, you're just attention-seeking. Well, yeah. Why? Why, why are you why attention-seeking? Attention seeking? Yeah. Yes. And, and what is it missing? What are we yeah. missing here? And yeah. and so the reason I mention it as well is that um, information gets passed around. Yeah. So, it, you know, first of all, it can normalise it, which is always worrying. And, and this happens in schools where... And, you know, and no blame to the schools because it can be very difficult to control once it starts getting into one particular section of the school and they pass information mm. around. But the reason I bring it up is actually because parents need to be aware of the websites that are out, out there and um, accounts which can be very encouraging and enticing yes. for people who are struggling with their emotions and they'll give tips on how to do these things. So that's one thing to have a really clear guideline yeah. on that the, you're, you're, you don't want your children yeah. accessing this mm. information. I think the idea that people do it because others are doing it is also you have to be mm. really careful with because mm. yes, they get ideas. I guess if may, I don't know, but and I don't want to be categoric about it, but if somebody hears the idea of cutting themselves, if that's the chosen self-harm, um, and then thinks, oh, that's a good idea, I'm going to try it, there's something already really wrong. Mm. You know, if somebody's in, feeling good about themselves and in balance, they're going to go, oh, that sounds horrible, I don't want to do that. Exactly. And the, just, uh, I, I nearly faint if my child comes to me with a splinter in her finger. I don't <laughs> want to hurt myself and I can't stand seeing it on someone else. So, yeah. you know, it would, it would just be anathema to hurt yeah. myself in that yeah. way. I, of course, there are other ways I could hurt myself, but yeah. the point being that it would never occur to me. And my daughter said to me something that was very insightful, which is she said, the thing that I've realised about it is that it's not just the person who suffers, it's the people around them, mm. because we are all involved in it. We all get sucked up yes. into it and it's painful. And that's when as parents, I imagine, um, you know, it must be unbelievably painful. You know, what's happened? Why is my child harming themselves? And we have to step back and and be really adult about it because... There's so much shame involved for the child. It's, it's a bit like eating disorders. You know, there's so much shame involved. Um, so, you know, kid gloves. So on that point, what can you do as a parent? Stay calm. Yes. Always stay calm. Always, whatever it is, stay calm. Acknowledge your own feelings. Yeah. As a parent, you're going to be angry, stressed, upset, 
fearful that maybe you've done something yeah. or, you know, not really being able to understand it and feeling perhaps that your child, why didn't they come to you? Yeah, I think we often as parents go to the default of it's my fault. What have I done? And it's not. And reach out to a trusted friend or a counsellor. There are so many websites, there are so many numbers you can yeah. call. There are crisis hotlines. There is so much out there. Don't feel... I, I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable about calling these things because it's it's they don't know these people and they don't know whether they can trust them or whether yeah. they would talk the language they want to talk. They also Just feel try. that they've failed as well as a parent. You know, you feel that what have I done? How have I contributed to this? And it may be nothing. They, your child, the child needs help. And stay open. Invite your teen to share what they're feeling, but don't, please don't force the issue. So I've had a um, a mother who I know who has had to deal with this and I loved her approach because she said, look, you can't try and force your child to talk to you if they don't want to talk to you and trying to tell them I need to see the injuries, you know, it's it's very intrusive and they're already struggling. Yeah, and it's that's that's the symptom as well. It's we yes. have to keep remembering that's the symptom. It's not the the actual problem. So also saying to a kid, you know, oh, brilliant, you haven't cut for a couple of weeks. Great. Um, we were, this was talked about last night, actually, you know, the, your, your automatic reaction will be brilliant. Praise. Great. Which is good. But what if and it's quite likely that child then goes and harms again in a couple of weeks, they're going to feel like a massive failure and probably not want to open up to you again because they'll feel like they've you know now they've messed it up again what a great point so a better way would be you know that's great you know it's really positive and i'm you know i'm here if that changes yes and be patient it's not yeah. likely to stop quickly no. even when they've got therapy so no. this is the big point is that this is a diversion they've learned this method yeah. for trying to cope with yeah. emotions that they can't really frame properly yeah. and they might never frame it i mean it's a bit like Asking an alcoholic, why are you drinking? Why are you numbing? Some of them are really clear about it. They know exactly why. But a lot of people, they don't know. If something just feels really painful inside for whatever reason and they want to get rid of it, um, they might never be really clear about it. So that's, that's fine. Leave it. Yes. So I found some fantastic questions you can ask your team, which is what was going on in your life when you first began to injure yourself? And they don't have to tell you. You can say, here are the things I'd like you to think about. I think this is what they do in therapy as well. How do you feel just before yeah. you want to injure yourself? What are the habits and routines? Are, are you always in the same place or with a particular person? It's about kind of investigating around it in a curious way. We talked about this with anxiety rather than problem solving, yeah. going at it in a curious way. And they may not want to talk about it no. in this detail, but you can go back in little little drips yeah, to try and seeds. get themselves to know themselves. Yeah, sowing seeds of what might be, what might be underneath, how they feel. Mm. And do I always feel the same emotion when I get the urge to injure my to myself how can I better deal with the situations that trigger me yeah and if you have a child who knows someone who's struggling it's very helpful for them for them to understand that it is about distress and that if they can provide any support to the teenager just by being a listening ear yeah. or just giving them space or anything that they yeah. need that's a really valuable thing to yes. do and it's really really important it can make a massive difference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I loved her approach because she said, you know, the thing is, it's really important that I didn't keep saying why. And let yes. show me, show me the, show me. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it, like you said, it's shameful for the person yeah. when they're doing these things, they are, they're in crisis. They're in, they're, they're trying to get rid of it or express an emotion. So keeping going back to it and asking for proof is not going to help them deal with whatever it is that's no. caused it in the first place. The lady who was speaking last night, who was fantastic, she she likened it, which I thought was a really good way of, of talking about it, to somebody crying and you wipe away their tears and their cheeks are now dry and you're like, well, you know, job done, solved. That's like stopping the, the self-harm and then going, well, we're good now. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah. that's just the symptom. <laughs> What's going on underneath? Why is the person crying? Why is the person doing it? Yes, brilliant, brilliant point. Practical tips. We, we love some practical tips, don't we? So 10 practical tips were from Dr. Fans Funnenberg. And I read another blog by someone who's been affected by self-harm. And they give all these practical tips of things that you can do. For example, something like having a an emergency pack of yes. things 
ready for the teen so that if they do just feel this this overwhelming urge to try and do something, perhaps they could squeeze an ice cube instead. Yeah. You get that same shot of pain, but it's not going to harm yeah. their body. And if they've already had a think about what is it they're getting out of the harm, you know, how do they feel after the harming event? What's the purpose of it? Then they can find activities that maybe slightly match that if that's mm. at all possible mm. and you use a really good technique with your son which mm. is when he's feeling really angry that he has a trigger word yes. well one of the things that uh came up was having a communication system so there's a red there's an amber and when they feel that who are they going to talk to yeah that's brilliant when you know are you amber and when they say they don't have anybody that they can talk to about it it's not that they don't have someone to talk to it's that they don't have someone they feel comfortable talking to so it's about trying to find someone or some way that they can express what they're feeling yeah and that might be you but it might not be and that's okay absolutely right and remind your it's normal to experience strong emotions like sadness, anger, fear, anxiety, and that they don't last long. Yes. This is one of your great ones, My isn't mantras, it? Yes, <laughs> nothing lasts forever. Everything. How long is how long? Because you said that how what's the time an emotion lasts if you, 90 if you don't seconds. feed it? 90, 90 seconds. Yeah. So it's that sort of stall. Yeah. Stall. Watch a funny clip yeah. on YouTube. Watch some do something that will so say, okay, I'm allowed to, but I need to stall, not feed the emotion. Mm, and it will pass. But we our bodies and our whole survival survival instinct is telling us that it's going to kill us yes so we have to be pretty strong in it yes and young people often catastrophize yes they feel that they're going to fail in life spectacularly mm. the onset of uh, self-harm the most common one is 13 mm. and this is Gosh. when they're being confronted with big changes yes. in their life things that they've never experienced and we all know that first time you fall in love and then it goes wrong yeah. and you think you'll never be loved again or you'll never love again. And, yeah. it, you know, and it can be, it feels catastrophic. Yeah. But then once you've been in love or you've been in love for a very long time, um, you know <laughs> that you've got a lot more under yeah. your belt. And that's actually one of the greatest lessons, isn't it? We can we can help our kids with is things happen, they pass and you get to the other side. Yes. Um, yes. And we don't like that. <laughs> yes. And helping them to to know that even if their immediate hopes don't get fulfilled, there will be a future where yes. they could come true. And it's sort of been give, giving them a long term perspective mm. on how to manage their emotions and that things can get better. Yeah. And it's kind of a, a, a wider trust that you'll be fine. You will be OK. Whatever happens along the way, you, you'll be OK. Yes. And reminding them that you love them unconditionally. It's yes. got nothing to do with their success in anything. <laughs> so it's actually whilst we there, there are many 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 reasons why somebody might self harm the way in which we can help as parents is also looking at ourselves what do we do when we're struggling with intense emotions yeah do are we self medicating as they yes. might call it for example with alcohol or are we doing other things you know that would then lead our teenagers to think this sort of behavior is acceptable yeah, or it's good. a good way to deal with problems really good i think that's a really good point and also it can help us to have a conversation with our teens as and they might think oh mum doesn't really get it but it's also it's showing that we want to understand so yeah I, you know sometimes i feel overwhelmed sometimes i feel completely out of control and and then i you know personally i go for a run or whatever your own thing is so that they have a an understanding that you you do you're at least trying to understand what where they're coming from. Yes, and so and when you see an emotion, because a lot of these teenagers are struggling to identify the emotions and process them, mm. so we can be very very helpful by spotting an emotion when it occurs and saying, oh, "I think I think you're feeling this." Yeah, and uh, is is that right? And then they are, they can then perhaps verbalize it, or they may say, "No, that's." Yeah, Not yeah. Even right. if yeah, that's um sort of therapy training. You know, if you see a flicker of a flicker of a an emotion in in what's being said, you go, oh, that, if it's a slight annoyance, and you, oh gosh, that that must have been really annoying. And then they either go, yeah, it's really annoying. And then this happened, rah, 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 and then you you know that you've that's resonated and that's helpful for them. Or they might go, 
well, no, actually, it was more, I felt more actually sad or whatever the situation is. And then you can explore that with them. But if you're mirroring it back and, you know, feeding it back the whole time, oh, so it, it felt like that. Um, that's really helpful for them. Yeah. So I think all all the time, and I know it sounds quite intense and you don't have to be doing no, this all the no. time. But the point is that you've got somebody in your family who is going through new emotions that they're struggling to yeah. understand. So anything that everybody in the family can do to support them with yeah. that and the school too and encourage them to stop their thought train and get off it. Yes. So, so un- <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, and th- but there was another lady I saw who was talking about her own experiences and she said the thing that I found helpful was do the next right thing. So yeah. rather than saying, I'm not going to do, because if you say, don't look at the pink elephant, everyone looks at yeah, the pink yeah. elephant. So if you say, I'm going to find the next good thing to do mm. and use that really good to keep me going until I've got through these intense emotions. Yes. And also the idea that just because a child um, self-harms now, as awful as that is, and I'm not belittling that in any way, um, you know, they can be helped and it's a phase and it's a difficult time in their lives, but it's not a life sentence. Yes. And I'm not just focusing in on it. Oh, my God, my child's self-harming yeah. and my everything's. So yeah. so actually pointing out the great things in life yeah. and making life feel more light so that they're not dragged yes. constantly back into reminders or dragged constantly back into this depressive and, hole. And their every day isn't a constant checking in on the self-harm. Have you cut yourself today? When did you last cut yourself? What are you doing? Where are you going? Because, um, I mean, that doesn't sound very fun no, <laughs> or a good no. way of... <laughs> getting away from it and I, I, it. I know there's one mother particularly who said look I've you know my daughter does self-harm I found things in her room mm. that to me look like they would be used for that I don't know what to do do I take them away do I talk to her about mm. it what would you think Susie oh, I don't know that's, a, that's a, a really good question I mean from the the talk and things I've read about and heard about as well you know you can minimize the risk as we spoke about before you can minimize the risk of of these things um which is a really good thing to do you know you don't want them doing these dangerous things um but it's not solving the problem you know no. it's, it's again it's it's um the problem underneath but yeah minimize the risk yeah I wonder whether it it is worth bringing it up and saying so I can see that maybe you are struggling again yeah. and why don't we find diversion? So yeah. one of the things I found, and I don't want to equate the two, but one of the things I found helpful with eating when I overate was that I realised that there I was doing it as a distraction mm. and I made a list of things that gave me pleasure. And instead of going down that route, I would go, I would choose something yes. from the list. And it actually was really effective. Now, obviously, this is not the same thing, but having a list of things as a standby, yes. ready for those catastrophic moments when they can't cope. So having the emergency pack, for example, of things that they like slashing an empty plastic bottle instead of their own arm. Mm. Yeah. So even just um, having that conversation with them that they can maybe start to think oh there are alternatives even yes. if they can't do anything on that list or that list doesn't help them it might do it might be amazing but the idea that there are alternatives yes. to feeling you know when you're feeling bad you you could do something else you might yes. not be able to for a while but you could that's a possibility in the future and in a way if you have this conversation in a calm moment when they're not feeling upset and you say, I recognise that you're not, it's not easy and it's not going to be solved overnight yeah. and I'm not telling you you shouldn't do things. What I'm trying to do is wrap you and, you know, yeah. wrap you up and show you love and say, OK, we're going to find, you know, alternatives yeah. and here they are. Or if there's something in their room you're unsure about, maybe, you, you know, you can ask them, you know, is there anything in here that you feel unsafe with me leaving in here? Or mm. is there anything you'd like me to remove? You know, what, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Yeah. And they might actually say this or they may yeah, think, they might, they have to may think don't look under the pillow. Don't look yeah. under the pillow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really um, but yes, our, the, the most important thing is keeping your child safe, obviously. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can, are concerned about suicide risk. Yes. The suicide risk goes up dramatically if they've self-harmed more than 20 times. Yeah. Don't sit there and count them. And, but just yeah. know that people who self-harm longer, it, do, it does increase the risk. Yeah. And I think people panic when because they have self-harm and suicide have been linked. Um, but they are tenuous. And I think the idea is really that 
behind the driving force behind both of those things is this horrible discomfort and pain and that's the link and um, they don't want to die most of no. them don't want to die no. they most just want to self harm do not commit suicide absolutely absolutely so don't panic about that the most important thing is you really do need help very few people who self-harm can just fix it themselves yeah. because what they've done is they've gone into a space where they found a technique to to help themselves mm. and it's not the right one and they need a slow unpicking of that by saying, <laughs> so those are my two dogs they have no manners and they get excited at the slightest movement outside so i'm so very sorry but uh moving on it's so important that you actually get help from somebody who knows what they're talking about and knows how to help unpick what's going on and that could be you know a many you you, you're not a mental health worker so you do need some support so there are lots of helplines and phone numbers and people to lean on yeah and also try to do it alone it's a lonely place to be you know it's it's really really important that as parents we get support when our kids are struggling with whatever that looks like it's hard (laughs) Now, Susie, Emily says the last episode covering anxiety and setting rules at home really made her think differently. She shared a great link on identity, which is a topic that we'll definitely cover at some point in in the near future. Thanks for that, Emily. It's good to have other eyes looking out for interesting material for our research. So always let us know if you see something you thought was really resonated with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily. Now, we all know that communication is at the heart of great parenting, but how we communicate matters just as much as what we say. I used to do a workshop for Parent Gym in which we looked at different talking styles, which was great fun. So I've decided to adapt it for us. Now, Susie, let's run through the styles and then we can talk about ways to adapt them to get the best out of our relationship with our teens. So I have got the shouter. So the shouter's special power is a super short fuse. Their talking style, they take their frustration out on their teen, especially at the end of a long day or when they're having a tough time. They find an excuse to lash out even if the child has done nothing wrong. They might be thinking, if I'm in a bad mood, I've got every right to let it out. They're most likely to say, are you still holding a knife and fork like that? For God's sake, will you ever learn? Or just shut up and give me some peace and quiet. They make the teen feel scared, guilty, nervous of setting their parent off, insecure and angry. And I've got the best friend. Special power, a runaway mouth. Talking style, they share too much with their teen. They talk about their personal issues, like, for example, their divorce and their feelings. Oh, I'm feeling lonely. And they ask their teen questions that are too personal and and they don't like disciplining their teen. They might think, me and my kids are best friends. I'm so lucky to have them to talk to. They're most likely to say, I hear your dad's got a new girlfriend. Oh, it's not fair. Why can't I meet someone? What's wrong with me? And they make the teen feel uncomfortable, under pressure to support their parent and and possibly resentful. So then the next one is the hot and cold tap. Their special power is mega mood swings. Their talking style emotionally unstable and constantly changes the way they talk to their child. One moment they're loving and talkative. The next they clam up and the next they scream and shout. They think, I try to be consistent with my teen, but sometimes it's hard. They're most likely to say, hey, should we get outside and play some cricket? And then five minutes later, damn, why do you have to do things that take up so much time? I've got to make supper and the laundry still hasn't gone on. Go and find something else to do. They make the child feel confused, insecure, nervous about what mood their parent will be in next. And finally, the ice queen or king. Special power, blank expression and unfriendly tone of voice. Talking style doesn't show any affection or any emotion, good or bad, to their teen. Doesn't talk to them unless it's to ask them to do something or tell them they screwed up. They think, possibly, I'm the breadwinner here. Teens should be seen and not heard. Very Edwardian, really. Most likely to say nothing at all. (laughs) Make the teen feel unloved, lonely, unsure of how their parent is feeling. And that then makes them feel very insecure. Ah, now, did you did you recognise <laughs> any of them? You don't know. I'll be honest, <laughs> all of them. When I was a younger parent, uh, my, my daughters were little. I think I was quite hot and cold yeah. happy. And the reason I was hot and cold was because I would get them home from school and I'd be so thrilled to see them and it would be pa- unpacking the day. How was it? Oh, lovely mm. children. And then my phone would ring mm. or my computer, I'd hear it ping. 
and I would still have a lot of unfinished business from during the day and my mood would switch because I would now be focusing on that and they would still be in full chatty chat mode yes. or wanting things and I'd snap yeah. and say, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, tr- I'm on the phone for God's sake. And I realised that actually that switch in temperaments can be very confusing. Mm. And I think it's still confusing. It doesn't matter what age you are. I mean, yeah. you think about whether your husband or wife or partner um, treats you like that. Yes. You can start thinking, well, what did, what did I say wrong? Yeah. It and it's amplified for a child. Yeah, it encourages sort of walking on eggshells type of atmosphere, doesn't it? I, I recognise the hot and cold tap from when my kids were little. And I think when I was going through my divorce and things were difficult and I wasn't, didn't have the capacity to, you know, so I wanted to be the hot one. But then suddenly, you know, the it got hard. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. then you're tired and, you know, you have a short fuse. So, yeah, I recognise that. Very, very easily done. And I think also the friend, I think the thing I always have to remind myself is that I can be their best friend, but they're not my yes. best friend. And uh, I think there's there's a fine line between sort of making a joke yeah. out of the things that are frustrating about your partner, yeah. for, and which I do sometimes, <laughs> Um and actually criticising them in front of your children. Yeah. So you sort of have to think, is this funny and is it funny to them? Yeah. And does it show that I still love them? It's not. Yeah. And I think if it sounds like you're criticising them, whilst it's sort of there's a frisson of interest there, it feels very uncomfortable. Yeah. For them if you I, say things like I that. I really like the idea that you can be, what did you say? They can, yeah, you can be their best friend, but they can't be yours. They can't yours. be yours. I like that because you can have, you know, I have ca- chats with my teenagers about, you know, who do you like? And, and we have, you know, girly chats, me and my daughter, and it's really, really lovely. But I would never be burdening her with my stuff. I think that's, that's then it's, then it's gone beyond what's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not a comfortable place. But I remember I know somebody who was told by his mother after his brother had died and she was divorced, she said to him, well, it's just you and me now. Oh. And that's a very painful, difficult thing to, yeah. to give a son. Yeah. Um, and it's not a role that is a very kind role, no. uh, to be honest. So no. we need to find other ways of dealing yes. with these things because we're human friends. beings rather than beating yourself up. So the true parent, uh, their special power is their perfectly balanced levels of affection, sharing and discipline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, totally recognise that. I, I'm exactly like that for five <laughs> minutes a day. Um, they're talking style. They have friendly chats with their child. They say, I love you, is open with them, but never shares too much. They're willing to discipline their child when they need to be disciplined. Um, they think my child knows I love them, but I'm their parent, not their best friend. Um, and I, I will explain to them that something's wrong if it is wrong. Yeah. And I said discipline, but actually, you know, they it's about putting boundaries in place. Yes, and boundaries, yeah. yeah, most likely today, um, sweetie, can you put the can you lay the table rather than right? Have you laid the table? You, you got that wrong. Where's that? You know, <laughs> it's it's about just the way you talk to them. Yeah. And I always say to my kids. I will talk to you the way I talk. I expect people to talk to me and the way I'll talk to, you you know, the cleaner who comes in. I would never direct them without being polite. I'm I'm conscious about how I treat other people and I'm expecting them to be the same with me and likewise me with them. Mm, Absolutely. And it makes a child feel loved and secure, but confident that there are rules, there are boundaries and they need to be upheld. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think we flit in and out of all of them. And that's fine. We're not trying to be perfect. No. We can't be. No. And that, the, I mean, the shouter, my father was a shouter. Yeah. And it's, it's, it makes you, I spent a lot of time trying to watch what, because he would tell me off and I think, oh, okay, I shouldn't do that. I need to, and I would watch him to see what I was yes. supposed to be doing. And then I'd realise that a lot of his shouting wasn't, you know, it wasn't consistent and it didn't, it, it didn't come true. I, I couldn't work out what it was I was doing. No. And eventually I just thought, okay, well, I'll just switch off. Yeah. Because, you know, there's no point listening to you because none of it, it is work. consistent. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So it's not a really good way to be. And it doesn't feel very nice as a parent. I mean, it, in our generation, and I don't know how it was earlier, maybe they felt that that was the right way to be. I, mm. I don't know. Um, but no, you know, that's the thing that I get 
told loads of times from my clients, you know, I, I shout at my kids. It feels it feels really horrible. Nobody wants to. I've shouted at my kids. It feels mm. horrible. So we need to learn the tools that yes. um, help us to not do that. And then also forgive ourselves when we do because we're human. And I used to use a phrase with my kids when they were younger. I'd say, shouty mummy is going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> and when I said that, my kids really paid attention. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I have a picture. What did Shouty Mummy wear? What did she look like? <laughs> and, and I use it on my husband sometimes. <laughs> Brilliant. Not Mummy, I hope. No, no. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, because I very rarely, and that's the interesting thing, I very rarely lose my temper. But when I do, it's very noticeable. Right. And that, in a way, is much more effective. And yes. it's, um, yeah. I yeah, think it's absolutely. really important to have a home where you feel safe. Yeah, I mean, I I know for sure that I used to lose my temper a lot more when the kids were little, and when I was when things were hard for me, I was going through the divorce, moving countries. You know, things things were. I was under more strain, so your fuse is shorter, and um, they hated. You know, whenever I lost my temper, they hated it, mm. and you know, they would feed that back immediately. <laughs> 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 and I think with the Ice Queen and King, my husband has a tendency to be like that. And I think it's because he's very preoccupied. Mm. He's both preoccupied because he's a sort of planet brain and he's in his head a lot yes. of the time. But I also think it's just his style. And I also think he was brought up in, in that style yeah. where boys and men didn't really express what yes. they thought or felt. And I think he often doesn't realise how when he walks into the room, if he is in his own mental space... It, there's this like iciness that passes yeah. the room because yeah. because everybody notices it except him. Yes. And and so my point is he's not trying to make other people feel no. uncomfortable and he's not. And then he'll notice the child, my teenager, doing something wrong and he'll point it out. Yeah. And that doesn't feel very nice. No. But he's changed a huge amount because we've given him some really constructive feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. As the chef, you know. <laughs> no, and my and my one of my daughters is brilliant because she'll always she's an attacker. So mm. she will if he picks her up on something, she'll say, Okay. And then she will watch him every moment <laughs> until he does it. And then she will point it out <laughs> and say, well, you, you said, you said. So actually, as a, as a family, we've really yeah. progressed as human beings just because we're all feeding back to each other. And that's the great thing about families is, is it's a place where you can sort of cut your yes. teeth in yeah. a social way and learn what behaviour does and doesn't work. Yeah, and experiment with different yes. things. And maybe that's the whole point of having these categories because, of course, they're fluid and, of course, we dip in and out of all of them, is awareness, isn't it? It's awareness mm. of are you just copying your family style, yes. like you said maybe your husband is, without questioning it. You're just, because that's what we do. If we don't question, we just do what our, we either do what our parents did or we do the opposite, like we've spoken about before. And then, you know, an awareness of, well, do I like the way I am? You know, do, do I like being like that? What works? And can I, do I want to try something different? Yeah, absolutely. If we don't have the awareness and how, how can we choose? And I remember my friend's husband going for, she, she refused to marry him until he'd actually had some anger management. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and you know, what he learned was that he'd learned that technique yeah. from his father yes who would also let yeah. out his feelings and emotions and for my friend it came across as you know really unpleasant yeah. but in his own home that had been the usual technique for yes. dealing with you know being cross or upset yeah that's really cute. which is you know it's unfortunate because it was affecting their relationship thankfully yeah. he did and it all worked out yeah. um so how can we give you some top tips the i'll give the shouter top tips get rid of frustration by doing something physical like going for a run uh, if you've had a bad day at work, rant at a colleague or a friend instead of your kids. Don't use your kids to deal with this. You need to find or even write it down or whatever. And when you feel yourself about to snap at your kids, leave the room for five minutes and take some deep breaths to calm down. I, I teach my kids this technique. And I and I'll if they've upset me, I'll I'll say we're not talking about this right now. I'm feeling emotional and it's not going to work. Yeah, it's practicing the pause, isn't it? I had to do that this morning <laughs> when my teenage boy missed his bus and I had to drive him to college. Well, I chose to drive him to college and missed something I had to do. And our car, car conversation started with me being like, <laughs> <laughs> and then he sort of looked at me and went, are you picking a fight or something? And I went, oh, yeah, OK, right. OK, I've chosen to drive you in. OK, let's just talk about this in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And it was much better. So top tips for the best friend before you share something with your child. Think, how is this going to make them feel? If the answer is uncomfortable, embarrassed or under pressure, don't do it. 
build up a circle of friends that you can talk to so you don't have to rely on your kids. And if your child is misbehaving, don't be afraid to discipline them. Even if they get upset and you feel bad, stand your ground. That's your job. Yes, I've spoken to quite a few parents who have uh, felt uncomfortable about setting boundaries. Yeah. And and there are, there are lots and lots of discussions between parents about what is and isn't acceptable. And there are lots of parents who are quite strict, who find it shocking when they see that there are no boundaries yes. in other houses. And so, yes, these are sliding scales. We all have different yeah. tolerances. The hot and cold tap. If you're feeling wobbly, take yourself away from your kids until you're feeling more stable. If you're feeling emotional, full stop, mm. shouter, whatever it is, just try and remove yourself first. If you swing between huge highs and massive lows, it might be worth talking to the doctor. If you are actually, if, you, if there's not a really good reason. So, for example, with me, there were things triggering it. I took away the things that were triggering it. So the, the phone, I switched everything off. Mm. so that if I was with my children, I was present with them. Yeah. If you're finding these big highs and lows and there doesn't seem to be a really good trigger, then maybe you might have bipolar issues or there might be other things going on that are worth talking to a professional about. If you've been unreasonable with your child or teenager, apologise. Give them a hug and a kiss and say, I'm really sorry, that that wasn't necessary, I was just feeling this. Because you'll gain their respect because they'll think, OK, I get that. Yeah, But if it doesn't get dealt with, then it's just going to make them feel awful. Yeah, we all have ups and downs, don't we? We swing, all of us, because we're human beings. It's just working out how do I deal with it. Um, so the ice queen or king, tell your child you love them. Spend at least 15 minutes a day, this is recommended in here, having a friendly chat with your child or doing a fun activity. Hug and kiss your child when they're behaving well or because you feel like it. Yeah, my eldest teen i i actually did hug him not when he wanted one the other day and we made a joke out of it i was like come on i'm gonna hug you that's so funny like, okay and he stood embraced did, did, did he actually had his hands by his side yeah i made him put them up around me and said come on come on do this you can do you can do this it was very funny and the other two who were really huggy were like going come on you can do it that's hilarious that reminds me of my my daughter when she was quite little and this boy who was her best friend who'd come up to give her a hug and she stood there with her hands by her side and he said no like you mean it yeah <laughs> And it's a balance, isn't it? It's because, of course, we don't want to make our kids, you know, be physical when they don't want to be. Yeah. Like, but you can do it in a jokey way. It's yeah. We're just mucking about. I loved it when uh, one of my old boyfriends said that his father, they'd be driving along and his father would just grab his hand and yeah. hold it. And I thought, oh, that's like I do that with my daughters now. It's lovely, yeah. Yeah, just the holding hands, that, that connectedness. Yeah. And you don't even have to talk. You don't have to. You know, sometimes it feels less sort of too intense yeah. if you're doing that but then they know they're yeah. grounded and they know and yeah. they understand mind you I said to my daughter the other day so you're grounded you, you know because she said oh I've calmed down now because she'd been upset about something I gave yeah. her a hug and I was just holding her hand and she thought I meant like, <laughs> like you don't go <laughs> <laughs> what that's really confusing <laughs> so don't use that term. It doesn't work. <laughs> I thought it was really upset. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so talking of talking, in the next episode, we're going to talk about effing and blinding. It's a term we use in England. Yeah. For those of you who are listening in America, Australia, Hong Kong, Dubai, it's swearing. Um, why is it so offensive and what do your teens get out of it? Also, we looked into teenage girls' friendships, so we thought it was time we delved into the way teenage boys relate to each other and how we can best support them. That's it for now. Don't forget to follow us on your podcast platform. Review us if you can. It really helps other people to find our podcast. And we're also on Instagram or Facebook and Susie's own website, which is susieasleymindfulness.co.uk. Until next time, goodbye. Bye-bye for now.